Okay, today we're going to be learning to Anik Daf Kapgimel. Nice to be back with everyone on the chat. Uh, I mean, on the Zoom. And uh, nice to see you all back from my trip. And we will get started. We have a sponsorship for this month. This month's stuff is sponsored by Minneapolis Hadron Group in memory of the father of their organizer, Shira Krebs. Shira's father, Jerry Katz. Gershom Pinya Ben Yitzchak Lev Cohen Zichronol Levracha. Love learning and family beyond all else. He raised three daughters and a son to be dedicated to Torah learning. And his legacy lives on not only through his family, but through the Hadra Minneapolis group as well. He passed away two weeks ago and he will be greatly missed. Today's stuff is sponsored by, also by Ellen Golub in loving memory of Ruth Kalish Weiss on her first year at site. Ruth was a pillar of strength to Israel and the Jewish people. She was an inspiration to her daughter, Deborah and Robert Finkel and grandchildren, Max, Hannah and Aliyah. Today's stuff is also sponsored by Mindy and Eric Hecht and family in loving memory of Mindy's father, Dr. Charles Feldman, Yitzchak Tzvi Ben Yaakov Alea on his 10th year at site, which was on the second night of Hanukkah. We miss him dearly and know that he would love to be part of this great learning endeavor. And today's stuff is also dedicated for myself and the Hadron Zoomers to Sharon Russ on the sudden loss of her mother on Shabbat. Our thoughts are with you. Okay, we are going to get started with our very long and interesting duff. The Gemara at the bottom of Kaf Bet talks about, um, one second. Our Gemara on Kaf Bet, on the Bet, talks about at the bottom, Tanu Rabbanam, Benatati Gishmechem Bi'itam. The rains will come in their proper time, not in a drunken way. Interesting, they use drunk in context here, not in a thirsty way, but in an average way. And we'll see this later. It's almost an allusion to the Choni Hamagel story. If there's too much rain, it messes up the ground and doesn't bear fruits. Another way of explaining this, what's Be'itam in their proper time? On Tuesday nights, although some people say Revi'il comes from the Revi'a, which is the time the rains are supposed to come, and B'lele Shabbatot on Friday nights, okay? There's certain nights of the year that it's good, or nights of the week, best for the rains to come. Why? Friday night, we understand, because people all came home from work early and they're not walking around the streets. And Tuesday nights, why? That's pretty random. Well, Rashi explains, if you remember from Sachim, those last Dapim and Sachim where I talked, there were all those Dapim on Kufi Beg, Gimel Dalit about the Shadim and the evil spirits. The evil spirit of Igrapa Machlat goes around on Tuesday nights, and therefore nobody's out around, nobody walks around on those nights. So, therefore, those are the best nights for the rains to come. Um, and then they say, Shekem Matsinu, we saw this, Bimei Shimon Ben Chetach, or Shimon Ben Chetach, there's different ways of pronouncing his name, remember him from the Mishnah of the Choni Amagel story, Sheyardulam, remember he was very critical of Choni, we're going to see that again today, Sheyardulam Kshamim B'Lelei Rebi'iyot U'Belelei Shabbatot, the rains came for them on Tuesday, on Tuesday nights always, and on Friday nights, Ad Shana Zuchitim Kichlayot, it was so amazing that, and here's our typical Gemara exaggeration stories that the the wheats the grains of wheat were as big as kidneys and the seorim the barley was like garinez eighteen like the pits of the olives and adashim and the lentils were kedinareza have like the gold okay remember these images maybe we'll come back to them later one having to do with people's bodies one having to do with food and one having to do with um with coins money okay so we have these. These little seeds or kernels are now gigantic. That's how amazing it was because the rains came in their proper time on those nights where the rain was supposed to come. And because of that, there was all this plentiful blessing. And what did they do with these amazing things that they have besides eating them? They kept a little bit to remind the future generations. To show them how much sin causes problems. Because look, they said in a time of Shemran Shetach, when now, it's hard to say nobody sinned, but I guess the people were in a good place. These amazing miracles happen, and they're no longer happening nowadays, so they kept a part of this to remember that. Your sins caused you to stray, and your sins prevented the good from coming. This is the good, the, the huge um, kernels. Also in the time of Herod, what was that happening? Then they were building the temple. Right? If you ever do renovations, you know that when it rains, they have nothing to do, right? The workers can't work. So here, when they were building the Beit what happened? It would always rain at night. Right? 
right? And then in the day, in the morning, the winds would come, blow away the clouds, and the sun would come out, and everybody would be able to work. So it's great when it rains at night, other than people who have trouble, kids who have trouble sleeping when it rains, which I have in my house. So, you know, I understand that even though most people prefer it rain at night, as always, there's some people that it's good for and some people that it's not as good for. Okay, now we're going to go on and get to the Choni Hamagel story. Okay, Okay, I'm not going to, I realized when I taught it in Hebrew, I read back in the Mishnah, but it took too much time and then we couldn't finish the daf, so I'm not going to do that in the English. But you can try to look back at the story and we'll try to mention a few differences that don't appear in the version of the Mishnah, okay, or that appear here and not in the Mishnah, or that appear in the Mishnah didn't appear here. So you can do a comparison. There's also a version of the Rishalmi, which is very, although actually the version of the Rishalmi is, is on the later part, um, also the later Choni story, which has a whole different version of the Yerushalmi. This is always interesting to see different versions of the same story. There's usually like a certain concept that's similar, but then it comes out differently in different places. because they're trying to stress different things. So that's a quote from the Mishnah. And now we get to the story. Tanu Rabbanan. In a bright it tells the story a little bit differently. We didn't have this whole introduction in the Mishnah. One year it was already the end of Adar and Lo Yerduk Shamin, and no rains came. So they sent to Choni Amagel and said, can you help us? Right? Pray for us and the rains will come. What's missing here? In the, in the story in the Mishnah, he says, go bring in your Tanurei Pesachim. Right? He had this overconfidence. And then no rain came. Here it doesn't have that line. But it says he prayed and no rain came. So what did he do? He made a circle. Now we're going to finally have an explanation why he made the circle. Just like Chavakuk did, it says in Chavakuk, on my guard I will stand, and I will stand on my besieged area. Okay, basically Rashi says he's almost like putting himself in jail. Okay, almost like I'm binding myself to this spot. Okay, one way to look at it is the sense that he's saying, I won't write, and that's what we're going to see. And he says, Amar lepanav, ribono shalam, vanecha samu panei amalai shani kibem bayat lefanecha, your children put your, their face upon me. Because I am like a, a, a child in your house. I'm like, I'm always in your house. I'm always with you. I have a lot of a strong relationship with you. Nishbani b'shumcha gadol sheni zaz mikan ad shtorachem abanecha. I swear in your name that I will not move from here until you have pity on your, your sons. Okay, now. What he's trying to say, I want to point out two things about this. Number one, he's saying, I'm going to be in this circle and I'm not moving from here. But on the other hand, he's doing something by putting himself there. He's also almost putting himself in a spotlight, right? You think about a spotlight, it's round. He's kind of saying, I, I want everyone to see me doing this, okay? And we're going to see this in comparison with stories at the end of the doc about his grandchildren that pray for rain in a way that nobody saw them. And he is doing it. We're going to see, right? If you think about Choni, I want you to think, throughout this story and the next story, is he a good character or does he have a number of important flaws? We're gonna talk about these flaws and I think that the Gemara is trying to highlight them, even though he clearly, his prayers were answered and we saw already Shimon and Manchetach's criticism of him. And we're gonna talk about what, when we look at Choni, is he all good or does he have some things that need work? So here, it could be this Uga, it's not so clear whether he's trying to spotlight himself and saying, I'm the one who's doing this in here. I'm standing distant from all of you because I'm in a different place than you. Or whether he's using it more the way Rashi says, almost as a prison, you know, I'm not moving from here until you answer my prayers. Now, why is he a Ben Bayit? So again, this goes back to the comparison we've had between the Tamidei Chachamim and the miracle workers. And the miracle workers are in a different category. They're more like a Ben Bayit with God. They have a lot to their... They're constantly in contact with God, whereas the Tamidei Chachamim are learning Torah, which connects them to God, but they don't have this direct line, so to speak. And what he's saying is, I have a direct line to God. So now, Amrulo, um, um, tell me, uh, sorry, I skipped the line. So now, Yitzchiluk Shamim Inatvim. So after Choni says, I'm not moving from here until the rains come, the rains start drizzle. okay? The rain, it starts to drizzle. Amrulo, tell me, Dav, the students come to him and say, Rebbe, Re'inu Chavelo Namut. We see you, but we're not going to die. Okay, what does that mean? Or we shouldn't die, or we don't know really what this means. There's many different interpretations. Rashi interprets as it near eot chavelonamut benichuta. Hishtadel shalonamut berav ben pnei atzirak shamim. We want to see you and we don't want to die. Okay, well, we'll get back to this. We want to see you kind of thing. But we want to see you and we don't want to die. Meaning, 
this is not going to sustain us, this rain that you brought for us. Okay. We want to be able to see you. We don't want to die. Okay. So um, again, there's different interpretations because why are they saying we want to see him? Not so clear. Um, it seems to us that these rains are coming just to have, you know, have a, put a check on, okay, you asked for rain, I gave you rain, but that's really not what we needed. So Amar Lo Kach Alti Sohoni tries to modify his words, right? He's constantly trying to fix what he's asking. Lo Kach Alti, I didn't ask for that. Yes, it's true, you brought some rain, I asked for rain, but I asked for Ele Gishmei Borot Shechinu Marot. I wanted things to fill the reservoirs, okay? These are different types of pits. Pit, a regular pit, a pit that's, that's a rectangle, that's a shiach, and a ma'ara is one that's covered, right? A cave. Your do bizarre. So God says, okay, you want to fill the reservoirs? Fine, I'll bring torrents of rain. And now again, we're going to have this exaggeration. We didn't see this in the Mishnah. And this sounds very much like the previous story about the, the kernels being the size of kidneys, etc. cetera. Each drop could fill the, cover, the opening of a barrel. And the rabbis has estimated that each drop that came down was at least the size of a load, which is a lot of, right? That's a, a measure of volume that's pretty large. Amrulo Tamidav, Rebi, they said, again, we're going to die. This rain is like, it's like a flood kind of rain. We're all going to die from this. It looks like God's trying to destroy the world, right? They feel like God is speaking to them through the rain. So God, he goes back to God and says, that's not what I asked for, even though it really was kind of what he asked for. And he has to keep, it's like when you, when you ask for something, you have to be very careful exactly how you word it, what you're asking for. So he says, right, that's what I really wanted. I want rain that's, that's, that's sought after. Bracha, blessing, and nidavav, giving. I want a nice, calm, peaceful rain, but that's going to give us what we need. So, Yardu Kitiknan, the rains came down the way they were supposed to, but think about how much rain had already come down. He says, There was still so much rain that the people went up to Harabai because it was a high spot where the rains weren't getting there, and they had to go up there. They couldn't live in the city because it was drenched with rain. Just like you pray for them to come down, now pray for them to go away. Now, we already learned in the Mishnah that you can't, right? That's how the whole Mishnah started with the Choni story. It said, you can't pray that there's too much rain and the rain should stop because that's a good thing and you shouldn't pray against a good thing, right? Rain is good. And therefore, it says, right, you should, and, and there we said, you can't do that. And they brought the Choni story where Choni said, I'm sorry, but I can't do that. This story is going to end a little bit differently. It starts off the same. This is what I, my tradition. You can't ask for it and say, that's too much good. Please take it away. But even so, we'll do it in some other way. Choni has a solution according to this version. Bring me a bull of thanksgiving. Okay, we want to bring an offering to God to thank him. So they brought him this bull. He does smicha on the korban, on the sacrifice. The people that you brought out of Egypt, interesting is mentioning this, because the people he brought out of Egypt also complained about too much this, right? With not enough water, not enough meat. Then they got too much meat. Then they complained too much meat, right? So he's reminding him of this. They can't handle too much of anything. Not too much good, not too much bad. You got angry with them, they can't handle that. You gave them too much good, they can't handle that either. May it be your will that the rains will stop. Maybe it's not exactly a prayer, it's more Yehi Ratzon, not so clear how he does this after he said he can't do this, but may it be your will that the rains will stop and there'll be plenty in the land. In other words, things will grow properly. Immediately, the wind blows, the clouds move over, the sun comes out. Right, that's something that comes immediately, the, the, the mushrooms, right, grow immediately and they were able to already gather something to eat. 
So there the story ends where the rains actually stop and the people get food. We didn't see that in the, in the Mishnah. And now we have what we saw in the Mishnah before with, again, a little bit of change. Shalach lo shema ben shetach. Il male choni atah. If you weren't choni, gozrani alecha nidoi. I would say you should be excommunicated. She'ilu shanim kishne aliyahu. Because if the years were like Eliyahu, Shemaftechok Shamim Biyado Shel Eliyahu, Lo Nimtza Shem Shamayim Mitchalel Al Yadecha, He says, if it were the times like Eliyahu, now what happened in Eliyahu? God swore he wasn't going to bring rain. What if now that's one of those times? Now we don't know because we don't have prophets anymore to tell us, but if God swore there would be no rain, and then you pray for rain, one of two things are going to happen, and either which way Shem Shamayim is going to be desecrated. Either God's not going to listen to you and that's going to look bad, or God's going to listen to you and go against his promise that he's not going to bring rain. Either which way, the name of God is going to be desecrated. So therefore, that's number one reason. And number two reason is what, what is inherent in what he says now. You sin before God. You speak to God in such a, an arrogant manner. God, bring rain as if you know you have the power to do this and, and you demand for God. Oh, don't do it like this. Do it like that. That's not a way to speak to God. And yet, but God does exactly what you want it. Like a son who's like a son who basically sins to his father and his father does exactly what he wants, kind of like a spoiled child who gets exactly what the child wants. Um, there was an interesting comparison. Rav Yaakov Emden makes an interesting comparison that was mentioned in this book, Fresh Fruit of Vintage Wine, which is a book about Agadot of Rav Yitzchak Blau. And he, he quotes there this interesting comparison of this story to Rav Lezer and Horkin's story. If you remember, the famous story where he brings all these signs from God that he's right when it comes to this halachic debate and the rabbis disagree with him and in the end they excommunicate him. And in this case, Shem Chetach also wants to excommunicate him, even though he has all these signs from God. In the end, though, he doesn't. And the question is, why is there a difference in each of these cases? And it could be, I have two possible answers. One my daughter mentioned yesterday is a suggestion that, that um, the in the, this case happened much earlier in history. This was more in the, this is still when there was a, a Beit HaMikdash around, Choni Magel. he was earlier. And that story happens after the destruction when already there's this whole issue of centralization of authority. And they're trying to establish the halacha like certain people and they're saying it's Loba Shamayim, it's not in the heavens. So that's one possible way of going about it. Another is to say, right, there was a different time and there was less of a need to excommunicate in this case. Another is to say that that was dealing with the halachic system and this was dealing with the system of prayer. And those are two different systems. In the system of prayer, maybe there's more leeway. We don't need to excommunicate someone if they do this. But when it comes to halacha, definitely halacha is lova shamayim, and that would kind of undermine the whole halachic system. So there, there was more of a need to do it, and that's why he actually got excommunicated, whereas he, even though he had signs of God on his side. Here, God's signs were able to protect him from the excommunication, okay? So it's, you could say prayer and halachic system are di- two very different, which is, I think, what's going on in this whole Masechet, right? This differentiation between the Beit Midrash world and the prayer world and the miracle workers, etc. So although we're going to see the Choni in another story does have a Beit Midrash world to him as well, right? Until now, there's, there's this always that these miracle workers are, they have a different type, right? In fact, in Daf Mishalahem, they talked about it this week, this past week, Shimon Kamutal, that there's this distinction between the, um, the on the one hand, you know, there's, there's rabbis or leaders that you go to for halachic answers, and then there's other ones you go to for brachot and those kind of things. And those are two different types of models, which you see here also as well. Okay, let's move on. So now he says, that's number, right? So number one, Maybe God decreed there would be no rain. And who are you to come and break that decree? Number two, or if you do, you know, either which way, Shem Shaman will be desecrated. Number two, who are you to speak with such audacity to God? But in the end, God listens to you. So it's like a son who goes against his father, but the father does it. Here we get more of a description where, where the child says, go wash, bathe me in hot water. Give me a cold shower. Give me all these nuts and, and fruits and things like that. And he gives, it's like a kid who just asks for everything. And the father just gives, gives, gives. The Pasuk says about you, your father and your mother will be happy with you, right? And you should, and um, they will be happy with who they gave birth to. Okay, that's the first story of Choni that we saw in the Mishnah, a mind of some minor variations here. And now we're going to go on and see, and I talked about before, the, the world of 
the, the rabbis and the Talmudei Chachamim versus the world of the miracle workers. Now we have a, a, a question which clearly addresses that. Tanu Rabbana, Mashachu, the Brighter says, Mashachu b'nei lishkat ha-gazit l'chon yamagel. What did the people, what was the reaction in the lishkat ha-gazit? What's lishkat ha-gazit? It's the room in the Beit HaMikdash where the Sanhedrin sat. What did the people in the Sanhedrin and the Beit didn't think about this? What did they send to Choni? Vatigzor Omer Bayakam lach va'adrachecha naga'o. Okay, they're going to quote these three verses in Eov and we're going to explain them. Vatigzor Omer, you decreed and it was said. You decreed it down below, and God did what you said up above. Now we're going to have a whole element that was missing from the entire story. If you read this story without this continuation and this, this explanation, you would say, this is a one-man show. It's a miracle, right? Choni prays, brings rain. What happened to the rest of our Masechet that we talked about? The whole point of the fast is not for your fast, not for your sackcloth. It's for people to change their ways. So comes the people in the Beit Midrash world and they say, this can't be that just there's a miracle happening, but there must be something more going on here. And therefore they add to this whole piece that obviously Choni, by doing what he did, move the people. And that's what was important, that the people change their ways. So let's see. Al-drachecha naga'ol, dor shahaya afel, Okay, al-drachecha naga'or, meaning on your path, it was light. So they're saying a door, a generation that was all dark, you enlighten them with your prayer. Your prayer moved people. Ki ishpilo vatomer, I'm just continuing in the verses in Eov there. Ki ishpilo vatomer gave, which means door shayash shafel higba'ato b'tfilotecha. Ki ishpilo, when you put them down, right? Vatomer gave, you brought them up, okay? You lifted up the people, you moved them. V'shach enayim yoshia. The nation that was low because of their sins, you save them. You were their savior with your prayers. Inaki Inaki is someone who's not naki, who's not clean. Again, a generation, this is all saying the same idea. Generation that wasn't clean, you basically save them from their, by your prayers. Because of your actions that were so clear, you were able to move the people. So here we see this element that, again, totally missing from the story, but the Gemara is trying to, right, using the source to bring it in, which is Choni must have moved the people. Otherwise, there's no, there's nothing to a prayer of a, of a righteous person, a chassid or whatever you might, a tzaddik, is only going to be useful if it has effects on the people which is interesting because you really don't see that from the simple reading of the story. The people just keep saying, what are you doing? That's not what we asked for. That's not what we asked for. But somehow it must be that in the end they were moved. Amar Rabbi Yochanan. Now we get to another famous Choni story and we'll see how the stories maybe connect. Okay, this is a story that much ink has been spilled on this story. There's a different version, like I said, in the Yerushalmi. This is the famous story of the carob tree in the 70 years. So Amar Rabbi Yochanan. Some scholars say, by the way, this first line doesn't belong here. It's a mistake but we're going to read it anyway and maybe try to explain it in the context of the story. And some people claim it's because of the Yerushalmi's version, which ends with this pasuk. Um, but anyway, the, the, the Yerushalmi's version, by the way, has a Choni living in the time of the exile, okay? Like in between this, the first and second Beta Mikdash, and then it wasn't the same Choni. Here it's clear, because it starts off with Rabbi Yochanan, says, Kol yamav shalotot tzaddik, which sounds like he's referring back to the tzaddik we were talking about. This same tzaddik, hayamitz ta'era mikrasi. He was very tor tormented by this verse. Shir hama'alot b'shuv Hashem et shivat Zion hayinu kechomi. We say this in Benching, right, on, on uh, Shabbat holidays, right, the song of ascents. When God returned shivat Zion, we were like dreamers. Okay, so now. Shivat Zion, the return to Zion was a 70 year period. So comes Choni and he says, Amar, it sounds like the whole exile was like a, one dream. But does anybody sleep for 70 years? Doesn't make any sense that, they, that it was a dream, 70 years worth of a dream. Again, it's a very hard question to really understand what he's getting at. Um, Mo, Moshe Shoshan has an article about this where he talks about that this is what he's really getting at is the idea of mortality. Okay, is there, he's struggling with his mortality. So, so in his, all his life, he struggled with this verse. And in the light of that, let's see what happened to him. One day he was walking on a path. He was planting a carob tree. How many years is it going to bear fruits? 
It's going to take 70 years. You might say that's very strange. Fruit trees don't usually take 70 years. There's an interesting note in the Quran that describes that if it was a male tree, a male usually male trees don't bear fruits, but a carob male tree could bear fruits after like 60 or so years. So there's some connection to reality here. It may be, right? You don't know when you plant it, whether it'll be a male or female, and maybe it'll be male and it might take 70 years. Here's where really you get the idea of mortality. It's what, you're going to live 70 years? Why are you doing something that's going to be beyond your lifetime? Okay, so he says, I woke up into a world with carobs. Just like my father's planted for me, I'm planted for my children. This is this whole idea of continuity, right? What's the, what's the answer to mortality, to struggling with I'm going to die? It's that there's continuity. We're part of a bigger picture. We're part of the earlier generations. We're part of the future generations. Interesting, because if you take this story and it sheds light a little bit on Kony, he was very much a here and now. I need an immediate answer, right? This isn't what I wanted. Go change. Very immediate. Everything's immediate. And here also, right? He's saying, why would you ever, he couldn't imagine why would you plant a tree that's not, you're not going to get any benefit from, right? It's all about getting benefit right now. So now what happens? So he says, Yativ Kakarach um, Rifta. What's his reaction? He goes and sits and eats. Okay, by the way, this Karach Rifta is going to come up a few more times. And I want to remind you that it came up in the Ilfa Rabbi Yochanan story. When they were debating, right, and they decide they're going to leave the Beit Midrash, the first thing they do, they sit and eat bread, remember, by the wall that was about to fall down on them. And they go and eat bread. It's almost like, ignoring anything else that's going on. Oh, let's just sit and eat. And so sometimes we escape into our food, right? We, we eat to escape. So I think that's what's going on here. So now he goes and he sits down to eat. And what happens? He obviously, we know the story. He falls asleep. Um, shinta, sleep falls upon him. Neem, and he falls into a deep sleep. A a big uh, cliff, or there's different translations, a grotto grows around him. He gets hidden from the eyes. I wanted you to remember this. We want to see you. Here he becomes unseen. And you're going to see that he really never becomes seen after this anymore. Okay, so now I see the connection. I see people who are saying Yosef's brothers also went to eat after they threw him in the pit. I like the connection. And he falls asleep for 70 years. When he wakes up, it's almost like nothing has changed, but everything has changed. Okay, so that's what's interesting about what happens when he wakes up. He sees someone picking carrots from the tree. Amarle, Atu de Chatalte, are you the one who planted this tree? Amarle Barbare Anna, I'm his grandson. Amarle, Shmamina, Denai Meshivim Shin. He realizes, ah, I've slept 70 years. Now, what should he realize? He should realize that there's, right, that there's, there's this continuity in the world, but he doesn't really seem to get the lesson. It's very funny that they all of a sudden start mentioning his donkey. It seems like everything's in the same place as he left it. His donkey's there and his donkey now had herds of donkeys, right? Many, many, many donkeys he gave birth to and, well, or she. In any case, now we see that there's, right, that there's this continuity that's gone on and life has gone on without him, basically. And that's going to be really what's happened here, okay? Azalabete, first place he goes is home. This is, by the way, interesting. There's another story of a rabbi who loses his house for many years and goes back, and he's scared to go home, and he goes first to the Beit Midrash and then to home. Here the story is flipped. He goes first to home, then when he gets no response at home, he goes to the Beit Midrash. So he goes to his house, Amrle, Berei de Choniamagel Mikayam. He says, Is the son of Choniamagel still around? Amrle, Berei Leita Bar Bereita. His son is no longer here, but his grandson is here. By the way, Yona Frankel does a good analysis of the story. And one of the things he points out is the person who was planting said, I'm doing it for my son. He connected to his father. When Choni comes back, there's no more, right? The father and son are often connected, but the grandfather isn't always alive when this grandson is born. In those days, especially when they had shorter lifespan. And what they're saying is here, there's this continuity between, there's this disconnect, right? That he misses this generation that connected and there's no longer any connection. So now he says, I'm right? You feel like this is a scene from Back to the Future, right? He says, I'm Lohim knew who they didn't believe him. They're like, you know, there's no such thing as time travel. You can't possibly be Chonia Magel. So he gets no response there. He moves on to the Beit Midrash. This is a very difficult line to explain. They said, there's one thing that's very unclear here. He walks into Beit Midrash and he hears the rabbi saying, are teachings, or maybe he's, they're even talking about Choni's teachings. It's not clear who they're referring to. One translation had it, 
the teachings of one of the students in the Beit Midrash, it's not so clear who they're referring to, but some teachings are like in the years of Choni Hamagel. Okay, what was unique in the time of Choni Hamagel? And all of a sudden, we're going to see from this story, they put him in the Beit Midrash also. He's not just a miracle tefillah person, but he's also in the Beit Midrash. In the times of Choni, when he would come to the Beit Midrash, any question the rabbis had, he would answer. So either Choni's answering questions and it reminds them of the times of Choni Amalia, or maybe someone else is asking the questions and then, and then he's reminded of Choni Amalia. You know, it's, it's unclear. But what they're clearly saying is, and this is, I think, what's very strong about this line. I think this is one of the strongest lines in the story. What was in the time of Choni is not really around anymore. I almost look at this as, you know, you think of Choni as a miraculous person. And this was a bit of a miracle. He walked into the baby trash and all of a sudden it was like, when he used to be there. And there was almost this miraculous thing. It wasn't just that he was so smart that he could answer every question, but it was almost miraculous about it because they even say, they don't say he's like Choni Amagel. They say it's like in the times of Choni Amagel where there was some miracle hovering in the baby trash. That anytime a question was asked, Choni would answer it. Um, so again, even though he's in the baby trash, it's more of a miraculous type thing that would happen in the baby trash with him. Now, what's interesting about this is what they're saying is, since Choni died, we haven't had this, which shows what? He wasn't successful in passing his legacy down, that whatever happened when he was alive disappeared when he was no longer there. Now that's not, it's not like the carob tree. Like the carob tree was there. That was the whole idea. And he didn't leave a legacy behind. And that's the tragic part of the story, I think. So now it's, he says what? Amar Lahu, right? He says, Ananiu, I'm that guy, I'm Choni, the one you're talking about, right? It's, it's, you know what else it's like? It's like the story of when, Rabbi Akiva is darshaning and Moshe is sitting in the back of the shear and says, what's he talking about? And then all of a sudden he says, it's from Moshe, right? I got this from Moshe. And, and Moshe realizes, oh, the Torah, right? I, I've passed something down. But in this case, it's, it's not. It reminds you of it, but it's not the same at all. Because it's saying there's something today that's like Choni, but it's not usually like that. And, and, and they don't believe in that he's Choni either. So now, that's the tragic line. They don't give him the proper respect that he deserves. So like in all good, tragic Talmudic stories, Chalash Date, he gets sick by Rachamei Umeit. He asks for mercy and he dies. Now, what's amazing about this, right? You're not supposed to ask for Rov Tova. You're not supposed to take away something that's good. Life you normally think of as good. And yet he asks again, he prays for something and he gets it and he dies immediately. By the way, I saw some people who said this line doesn't really belong here. It was taken from somewhere else. Where's this line famous from? The Rish Lakish Rabbi Yochanan story, right? Either chevruta or death. I need a chevra. I need, I need to be part of society. I can't be part of society. If people don't accept me into society, I may as well die. I don't have a place here. Um, Moshe Shoshan said that this is showing that he realizes his, he, his place. Everyone has a place in society. He was all upset. According to Moshe Shoshan, the whole idea is his mortality he's struggling with. And in the end, he realizes he needs to die and he doesn't belong in this time, right? Everybody has a certain time they belong. It's like the message of the Back to the Future movies, you know, totally different. Adraba, but right. But that you don't belong here. You can't go back to the, you know, you can't go back to the past. You can't go into the future. You, you can't, right? You belong in a certain time. And, and also this, I think he's, upset that he didn't really leave a legacy. It's almost against the previous section, which talked about how he was able to move the people. And here it almost sounds like he wasn't. Okay? He didn't really have a legacy to leave. Okay, now let's talk about his grandchildren. His grandchildren are very different than him, and we'll see how. In a sense, they're similar. In a sense, they're different. He was the grandson. When they needed rain, okay, it was obviously a hereditary thing. His grandson also, they would always ask to pray for rain. He would ask for rain, the rain would come. One time they needed rain. He said, they sent a pair of rabbis to him to ask for rain. He went to his house, he wasn't home. They go out into the fields. They see him working the land. They said hello to him. We're going to have a series of things he does that are very strange. And they're later going to question him about every single one of them. So he doesn't respond to them. In the evening, when he gathered up his, his um, wood to bring home, he took his, his wood and his and his hoe in one hand, on one shoulder, and he put the other, on his um, cloak on his other shoulder, 
Kula orchalo sayim misani. He didn't wear shoes the whole way home. Kimata lemai when he got to the water. Siyam misani. He put his shoes on. Kimata lehis mevihigi when he had thorn when there were shrubs and thorns, thorny shrubs and thorns. Dilini lemani. He would pick up his cloak. Right, which is strange. You would think your clothes would cover and protect you. Right, you would think also you need shoes on the ground. All these things seem quite strange. You would think he would say hello to them. You would think he would. The whole thing sounds very strange. Kimate the matter when he got to the city. Nafka de bitu la pe kimakasha. His wife came out all adorned, dressed up. Kimate the bete when he got home. Ale de bitu bereshi. He let his wife go in the house first. Hadar ail iu. Then he went in. Vahadar ailu rabbanan. Then he let the rabbis in. Yati bekarich rifta. Again, we have he sat down and ate bread. As if like what they don't. Right, they're not waiting for to ask him something. No, he sits down, eats bread, and worse than that, lo amar lehu lerabanan tu kruchu. He doesn't say to them, "Come eat with me." Halagrif to the inuke, he gives bread to his children. Mekashish echade ulezutratre. He gives the older one one portion and the younger one two portions. Amar lehu ledebitu. He says to his wife, "Yadana derabanan mishum mitrakatu." He says to her very quietly, "I know these guys are coming for rain." Nesik leigrav edibai rachne. Let's just go up to the roof and ask for rain. Maybe God will answer us right away. And then we won't, it won't be like we brought the rain. Let's go up before they even ask us. And then we'll ask for rain. The rain will come and then we'll say, what do you need? And they'll say, we need rain. And then we'll say, oh, the rain's already here. And then it won't be like we brought the rain. Here you see the opposite of Choni. Choni had no problem with the spotlight being on him. And he was the rain bringer. He, right, does not want that. Sakulegra, they go up to the roof. Kam iu b'chadas avita, b'iu b'chadas avita. This reminds us of the famous Rashi on Yitzchak and Rivka. They each went to pray in their own corner. He goes to pray in one corner. She goes to pray in the other corner of the roof. Kadim salak anani mehach savita didibitu. The rain, the clouds come, and the rain starts on her side of the roof. Kinachit, when they go down, amar lehu amai atu rabbanan. Now he goes to them as if nothing's gone on. And he says, "Why are you here?" Amru le shadru lehu the rabbanan legabeim mar tili bai rachem amitra. The rabbi sent me to ask for rain. Amar lehu baruch hamakom shelo etzrich etchem la'abachilkia. I baruch Hashem, you didn't need me at all. Amru lei yadina and demitra machmat maru da'ata. They said, listen, we know the rain came from you. We're not, right, we're, we're very observant. We got what went on, but we have a bunch of questions for you. Elalema lamar hani mile ditzmielan. Please answer us a few questions that we're very confused about. My time at kiavin in lamar shlam, alo azba lemar ape, when we said hello to you, why didn't you answer us? I work by the hour. And if I stopped to say hello to you, I'd be getting paid for, for not working. So I didn't want to waste any time. And therefore, I didn't answer you. By the way, I think there's a reference in these first two questions to the way he views himself compared to God. I'm just a worker for God, right? Like, I'm not, I'm not the person. I'm just doing a job, right? I'm like the conduit, but I'm not, I don't have significance on my own. Why do you put one on one shoulder and the, and the cloak on the other? I think this is also like my time in life is borrowed from God, right? It was this idea. The talit was borrowed, right? This idea of mortality that, that you know, Choni uh, didn't understand as well. My talit is borrowed. I borrowed it for wearing. I didn't borrow it for carrying things on it. I didn't want to ruin it. And then they would claim, oh, well, you ruined it. And I can't say, well, that was its normal use. So I could. My time akule or marmisani. Why didn't you wear shoes? And then all of a sudden when you got to the water, you did. I can see the whole way, but I can't see when I'm in the water. So I can watch my step when I'm outside the water. When I'm in the water, I can't see. And therefore I put shoes on. My time at Kimati Mar the Hizmi the Higi, Dalinu the Mani. Why did you pick up your cloak when you got to the shrubs and the thorns? Amar Lehu, Zem Ale Rucha, Vze Eno Male Rucha. If my skin gets, gets wounded, injured, it'll heal. If my cloak gets injured, it won't be able to be fixed. My time at Kimata Mar Lamata, Nafka de Bitu de Mar Kimakasha. Why did your wife come out all dressed up? Amar Le Kadesh Alo Itene Nabi Shachevet. So that I wouldn't look at some other woman. She wanted to come out all dressed up so that I would look, I have eyes only for her. Why did you go in the, Why did she go in the house first? Then you, then us. I didn't, I didn't know who you guys were. I didn't know if I could trust you. I didn't want to leave her outside with strangers. My Why didn't you give us bread when you went to eat? I didn't have enough bread. If I had offered you bread, you wouldn't take it because you'd say, I don't have enough bread to feed my family. So you wouldn't accept it. So if I offer you something, this goes on all the time, right? You offer someone something and then they say, no, thank you. And then you get credit for it for really nothing. So you said, I don't want to get credit for nothing. I knew you wouldn't take it. 
My time, Yav Marlin, Yunuka Kashisha, Chadarifu, Lazutre, Tre. Why'd you give one, one piece and the other two? Amarlahu, Hai Kai Bebeta. This one was at home. And therefore, he was eating, he was snacking all day. The high, right? Like when we were in Corona and everyone's eating all day long, right? Hayayat of Bebeknishta. He was in the Bekneset all day. So he was hungry. When he came home, I gave him a double push. Umaitam a Kadib Salik Anani Mehach Savita, to have a Kaim at Bitu, to Marla Ananadi day. Why did the rains come on her side? She is normally home. And therefore, when the poor come to the, the, the house, she gives them food. And therefore, she gives them immediate sustenance. And therefore, she gets answered immediately her prayers. I give money. And the money, then they have to go buy food. They don't get it immediately. So I couldn't get answered immediately. Inami, another option. This is taken straight from the Rabbi Meir Bruria story. Hanu Buryoni to have a There's some bullies in our neighborhood, thugs. Anabai Rachame de Lamutu. I pray that they die. Vihibai Rachame de Lahadru Bitiuvta. And she prayed that they were that they they repent. Bahadru, and she was right. This is the Yitamu. It's actually relevant in Barchi Nafshi that we say today in Davening on Rosh Chodesh, Yitamu Chataim in Aretz. It's Chataim, not Chotim, right? It's the sins and not the that. Okay. That's Story number one. Story number two. Hanan Hanichba. Hanan, the one who hides. Bar Barte de Chonia Magal have. He was the son of Chonia Magal. Kimitstrach Alma Lamitra. When they needed rain, have a Mushadra Rabban and Yinuka de Beirav the Gabe. They would send little children to him. Benachtelev Shipule Glimi. They pull on his cloak. Vaamrele Abba Abba Havla Mitra. Father, Father, bring us rain. Amar Lefnea Kadosh Brochu. We would say before God. Ribonoshalam. A Sebeshvil Elu Sheemi Kirim Ben Abad Yav Mitra La Abad Lo Yav Mitra. Give to these children who don't know the difference between the father who gives rain and the father who doesn't give rain. They think I'm the one who gives rain, but it's really you. Why was he called Hanan, the one who hides? Some versions, by the way, don't have beta kisei. Either he would hide himself in the bathroom, which means he would hide himself away from people so people wouldn't, you know, they would kind of hide away in the bathroom. I know people who do this, right? They stay in the bathroom a long time, so no one bothers them. Or he would beat Sanua in the bathroom. He would hide his body even in the bathroom. Some would say he would hide himself, meaning when he prayed, he would go to it silently so nobody would see him and realize that he was the one bringing the rain. Again, more like the Abba Chilkia and against Choni Hamad. Okay, moving on, because we don't have enough time to talk about all these stories, these fascinating stories. Amali Rabbi Zreka, the Rabbi Safar. By the way, at the Siyum, one of the, we're going to have, I didn't mention the Siyum yet, but the Siyum is going to be next Sunday, Ezrat Hashem, and Alana Kershan is going to speak about the Rabbi Yochanan Ufa story, and um, Katriella Friedman is going to speak about the Choni story. So we'll have more to be said about these stories. What's the difference between the strong people of Israel and the Hasidim of Bavel? Okay, when they needed rain, they would say, let's get together and ask for Rachami, right? There's strength in numbers. Maybe God will bring, but Takifei, the Ari Yisrael, were even stronger. That was Rabbi Yonah, who was the father of Rabbi Mani, who we're going to see in a minute. When they need a rain, this is what he knew, would do, Rabbi Yonah. When they need a rain, he would go into his house and say, give me my sack. I'm going to go get grains in the, in the shuk with my sack. When he would go out, he would go to a very low place, the valley, where nobody would see him. Right? Sorry, from the depths we call out to God, right? From from uh, Tehilim. And then he would go down low and he would cover himself with the sack so no one would see him, and the rain would come. When we would get home, Amre Aiti Maribur, they would say, "Did you bring us grains?" He says, listen, the price of grain is really expensive right now. By the way, he said before, I'm going to bring grain bazoos. That means the price, one zoos for the grain is a very high price. So he said to him, listen, I know the rains are coming, so I'm going to wait. I'm not going to buy it at the high price. I know that in a few days, the prices will drop because the rains are going to come, and therefore I didn't buy the grains today. So he would make it look like he didn't pray, but really he was the one who brought the rains. Vitu, and additionally, now we're going to hear about his son, Rabbi Mani. <coughs> Bere, his son, they would torment him. Again, we see this mitzal, okay? In the Benesia, 
He went and prayed by his father's grave, Rabbi Yona. Right? It's like you cry to your father, even though he's dead. He said, my father, my father, they're, they're torturing me. They walked by one day, those people that were bothering him, walked by one day the, the grave. Their, their, the legs of their horses got stuck in the ground right there by the grave. Okay, again, a miracle happened and they, until they said, okay, we're not going to torment him anymore. The two Rabbi Mani have a shechiach kameh to Rabbi Yitzchak ben El Yashiv. He often went by Rabbi Yitzchak ben El Yashiv. Amr le, atiri debe chame kametzaru le. He said, the rich people of my father-in-law's family are tormenting me. Amar le anu. He said, they should become poor. Vi anu. And they did. Amar kadach kuli. But now they're begging me for money because they're so poor, right? Because there's family. Amar le atris. He said, okay, fine. Let's make them rich again, right? This is, again, this is, goes back to the beginning. Be careful what you pray for. You might not necessarily want it. And also in this book, Rabbi Yitzchak Blau, he talks about these three things. One is wealth, the next is beauty, and the third is wealth. Uh, the third is intelligence, which are three main things that kind of move people in the world. So let's see. Um, okay, I'm not, my wife, she's not appealing to me anymore. What's her name? Chana. So he prays, this Rabbi Yitzchak ben El Yashiv prays for Rabbi Mani, may she become beautiful. She becomes beautiful. Amarle, kamigandra alai. Now she's, you know, using her beauty against me. Amarle, ihachi tachzor chanal shaparita. She should go back to being ugly. Okay, in other words, don't you don't always want what you get. Okay, bechazra chanal shaparita, and she became ugly again. This is a very strange story, right? The this whole thing of beauty being a significant issue, but again, it's saying wealth, beauty, right? These are not things you should pray to have or not have. It's not a good thing. But now you might think this would be something you could pray for, but let's see. They were learning in the Beit Midrash. They said, can you pray that we become smarter? Now you might think at least that has value, right? Maybe you could pray for it. Very ambiguous line. I had it, but I don't have it anymore. I sent it off. Meaning maybe I had the power to, to do this, but I don't have it anymore. And I'm sorry, but I can't ask for this. Now, why can't you ask for intelligence either? What he's trying to say is intelligence comes through hard work. You can't just pray and become intelligent, right? Just like you can't just pray and the rains will come and that's the end of it. But right, what we see in the Choni story, or at least in the, in the translation after, of he moved the people, right? There was more to it than just that, at least we hope, right? And that it wasn't just this one-time thing. You can't just pray for everything you want. It's not like, okay, get it turn it back. Okay. Like these stories, but that's not the way it goes. Prayer isn't it right. Be careful what you wish for. And there's more to it than there's hard work that has to come along with it. And it doesn't just come simply with those ideas. I will leave you for today. Nice to be back. Have a great day, everyone. And Chodesh Tov, Shavuot Tov and Chanukah Sameach.